Thank you. It's nice to see you here. And uh, I want to show you something I think important. It's more than only a business case because most of the examples came first from NGOs and social problems. Then they were applied to business problems for e-commerce. So um, the topic of my presentation is about spatial data, data and how to make it better, how to use it as a um, data scientist. And a few words about me. Um, I love open source and open science, and I feel that we must share every scientific research with everyone, and the same with software. Uh, up, up to some point, I understand that there are some business cases. And uh, I work as a data scientist and data engineer. Uh, most of my time I spend with cleaning data and wondering how to make it better to enhance my models. So that's why I think that data engineering is 90% of my job. Then I am a member of Hackerspace. So um, I like NGOs. I spend a lot of time in uh, non-governmental organizations. And uh, I dedicate myself for society. I think it's very important. And uh, I'm all, I also like hacking, b boying So when I stop coding, I go somewhere to dance. And I love pugs. If you have pug, you are my friend. <laughs> and um, what will it be about? Mm, the first, I will talk about spatial data, because I'm not sure how many of you know something about it. And uh, for data scientists from general perspective, it could be useful. Then we will gradually go to more um, to harder topics. The first one is spatial similarity and how our neighborhood is similar to our place. Then we will go to interpolation and it's something more than uh, feeling missing values with average or median. And at the end, uh, we'll talk about public data enhancement. And it's an important topic because we have a lot of public data, a lot of data from government. But it's, um, it, it's, we, its quality is very weak. And it's hard to um, merge it with our data from other sources. And spatial data. We have three main types of spatial data. Uh, one is point, and uh, those are coordinates in space, usually described by longitude and latitude, or X and Y. Then we have lines, and lines can be physical things, uh, like roads, uh, railways, or lines could represent some movements in space, so some temporal events. Then we have polygons, and um, we have a lot of data that is aggregated over polygons. We know that every country has some uh, median income, and we can watch uh, it on the nice visualizations. But how can we use it? It's a harder problem. Then also, I, I think that spatial data um, brings also addresses. So if we want to describe that something is at this street, it's also a kind of spatial data. We work a lot with time series, with networks and network analysis, and images, images that came from satellite observations. And there are two main packages that you must know if you work with spatial data in Python. And uh, which one will you choose? It depends from your use case. If you are working with some coordinates and uh, data that is described by points, uh, then you will use GeoPandas. And it's the same like Pandas, but it adds uh, additional column with geometry. So if you know time series from Pandas, uh, where index is time series, in this case, you have additional dimension, and it's a geometry. But geometry, as you recall, it can be points, lines, or polygons. So it, it's a rather complex thing. And the second package is Restereo. And uh, I personally started my journey with uh, geospatial data from this package. And it is used for uh, image processing, for, Im for satellite image processing, because images from satellites are not the same as those taken by iPhone. 
Uh, those images have additional metadata and coordinates that you must uh, process and uh, have control over it. And the first concept, spatial similarity. Mm, there is some theory or law, law uh, that everything is related to everything else, but new things are more related than distant things. And uh, mm, nowadays, it, it shouldn't bother you because it's, it's, not, uh, it's not true for every case. But in the case of spatial data, we are looking for those things that are related to the closest neighbors. So uh, it's very important for us. And here we have some example from industry. It's a mining industry, uh, also topic from today, uh, because it's about deep sea mining. And um, it's very hard to get a lot of samples from the ocean bottom. We can only get a um, few hundreds, maybe thousand, and that's all. If we apply machine learning model, it couldn't, wor it, it couldn't work. Uh, it won't work with it because there are two, uh, two less samples to work with them. So we must interpolate uh, how can some process or uh, some mater minerals, materials, uh, be placed over the surface. That, that's why we use uh, spatial interpolation. And first, we must check how similar or dissimilar our objects are our neighbors. This, uh, this is a very simple graph and a very simple plot, but it has a lot of information about some process. It could be uh, density of gold samples at some place, or it could be uh, customer spendings at some district, and uh, we analyze how similar our neighbors to each other. And if we see this curve, it's, uh, it's very nice because we can interpolate missing values, uh, missing places, and know uh, how our spending in the neighbors that we didn't sample before. And on the x-axis, we have distance. Uh, y-axis is parameter named semivariance. And it's a dissimilarity. It's a reverse of similarity. But if you start working with it, you will understand it. Uh, at the beginning, it could be tricky, because usually we don't measure negative things. But uh, what you see is at the beginning, at the short distances, this dissimilarity is very low. Uh, that means that neighbors are similar. Neighbors spending are similar. And at some point, uh, here it's about 25 kilometers. Uh, the similarity disappears, and the uh, uh, similarity is maximized. So it's uh, from this point, it's not um, algor our algorithm is not able to interpolate values. And we know that uh, maybe from the I, I will show you in the real world ca case scenario it will be easier to understand. OK, so here is the use case. And it is the use case from the last year when I was developing dynamic pricing model. And uh, we were interested uh, how close hotels, uh, how, how the proximity affects the prices uh, for this dynamic pricing model. And we wanted to know to, uh, how up many kilometers we should include neighbors uh, to control our price. And that's why we perform, we perform this spatial similarity. The, we build this semi-variogram. And we've checked that, mm, OK, up to distance of 10 kilometers, uh, we can assume that mm, renting prices are similar. So that's why we included it in our optimization model. But everything mm, depends uh, from the scale. If uh, I change the scale, then I can see completely different graph. And if I take wrong scale, uh, in this case, too big, there, um, there is no similarity at all. And it starts from a high dissimilarity. And it's, then it's lower and lower. So what does it mean? That uh, if we get those results, we should move away from spatial analysis, because it doesn't explain what's going on. And to get this, 
It's very easy because it's only a few lines of code, but you must know what you are doing. So you build experimental semi-variogram, and uh, you want to check uh, the distance uh, at which this similarity occurs between neighbors. The next step, if you, if you have built this uh, semi-variogram, you can go further and uh, interpolate results. And mm, this is another case. In Poland, you have only a few hundred stations that measure uh, air quality. And if you want to present map uh, like this on the web, uh, it, it wouldn't be very pleasing for viewers. So you can interpolate values. This is one uh, task. The second is that if you uh, have limited number of requests from API, you, uh, you could use this interpolation to build a map for the whole region, but only with few uh, points from, for the request. So uh, it's also savings. And um, one should ask, um, why don't we use inverse distance weighting? It's built in, um, in many packages, also in cloud services. And uh, personally, I use it a lot with Google Cloud. But for some cases, uh, it's not good uh, because you don't know how big power uh, should be. There is only one parameter, power, you use it, and you don't know how big it should be. Usually, the power is set to two, but uh, for it, it is only true for small regions. For the country region, it's not true, and you should change power locally, and that's why you use Kriging. It changes power locally. It's like local histograms, and it checks how big this parameter should be there. And also, if you use uh, Kriging, this spatial interpolation technique, you get some kind of uncertainty map, and you can check uh, where you should take another samples to have better results. And in my first encounter with this technique was many years ago, and uh, today I heard about something about government. I can tell a different story that uh, many years ago, the first time when I met Krieging, uh, I heard that some people just drawing lines uh, that are uh, uh, linking the points, and that's it. That's, it. that's the interpolation for the public tenders. And Nowadays, it's very easy to just use Python packages to do it, and it, it will, be, will be much better, and you can tell from where those lines uh, come. And um, there are a few steps. You just load data set, uh, check experimental semi diagram if there is any spatial structure, spatial similarity. Then you build a model. Uh, you load Canvas, the, mm, the map that you want to interpolate. And then you may check error distributions or do some cross-validation uh, or go in with another model or link it to some machine learning model. And uh, this is um, the second use case. Uh, as I said, you can interpolate missing points to reduce the number of API requests. And I use it for weather readings from so, uh, open weather APIs and small projects. Mm, code is a little bit longer, and uh, what's very important here, it should be checked by person. It's not uh, automatic procedure, it is semi-supervised, so the point uh, where people should check it is when you create experimental semi-variogram, you must check if there is spatial correlation. And mm, the last use case, it's uh, the most complex, is to transform public data sets that are aggregate over big areas. Here we have, uh, as I recall, it's breast cancer rates in the United States. And Mm, there are few problems with those maps, th this map uh, on the left. Uh, because if you look at it, uh, you 
automatically uh, think that the most important areas are those that are the biggest. And uh, you should get rid of this visual bias. And it, it because it can affect um, public spending. You know, it's, it's very important to get rid of it. And uh, the other thing is that not every point, not every area here is, uh, is populated. So you, you see it on the map on the right, there are some white points, and that means that there are no people that could uh, be sick that could get this cancer. And uh, here is another case of transformations. Uh, we have some um, also data from public health uh, about limeporeliosis infections in Poland, and it was aggravated over counties. It um, wasn't possible to get exact points uh, where people live. It's for the um, people's privacy, privacy. It's most important concern here. So, but we wanted to know um, which areas are especially riskful for people. And uh, we can build first model to uh, assess ticks occurrence, uh, and we've used satellite imagery. And one pixel was one kilometer per one kilometer. And one, the smallest county in Poland uh, has few kilometers, but the biggest one has more than um, few, a dozen kilometers. So it, it doesn't fit. It, you couldn't just put uh, counties into satellite uh, pixels and build model on it. So that's why it needs a transformation. And mm, it, it's more complex, but it's fully automated in the package that you can use. Uh, what are the reasons to uh, build it like that? Uh, because We've assumed that this functionality will be used mostly by social scientists, and they don't check this experimental semi-variogram. Uh, they are not interested in things that are going on under the hood. If someone knows the topic better, then okay, it could be checked. But for normal people that uh, from social sciences, it, it could be very, very difficult. And as before, we build semi-variograms, but it is a long operation. It takes a lot of time to do this. It's divided into two parts because it's an iterative process. And uh, I think that the package needs help here uh, with someone who is good with parallel processing because it, it could be speed up many, many times uh, with those skills. But uh, what is done here? We take uh, spatial similarity of, uh, area of centroids of specific areas where we have aggregated values, and then we check mm, population, uh, how population is divided over the country, and check semi-variogram of this population. And after some mathematical computations, uh, we try to fit this population semi-variogram to the semi-variogram of those aerial aggregates, and then we have something completely different, and we can build uh, specific, specific, we can go deeper up to the specific points uh, where population is grouped. And here is uh, crime rates derivation. I've cleaned this uh, only to show uh, the most volatile uh, places in Poland. Mm, but you get the many, many of those points. Uh, it only depends on uh, how uh, big are your population units. And a code is much longer if you want to do it by hand. Okay, so for me, that's all. Uh, I, um, I shared this presentation with you on Discord, and if you have any questions, Please feel free. Yeah.